welcome back to Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. Jim Caruso, if I told you that when we were working back in Australia that I had Admiral Phil Davidson on the line, your first question would probably be, what did you do? <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> so who is this guy, Jim, and why are we talking to him? All right, all right, right. Well, Phil Davidson, graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, career naval officer, culminating as the commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, our largest command, and for you and me, Ray, the most important command. So, Admiral Davidson, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, happy to be here with you today. Well, it's great. Well, let's, let's dive right in. Um, when I'm in D.C. or reading the press, there's a lot of discussion of the so-called Davidson window referring mm -hmm. to Taiwan. So it'd be great if you could clarify what this is and what it means and, and what you were actually predicting. Yeah, no, thanks uh, for asking, Jim. It's it's pretty interesting. I I see it um, in all kinds of contexts, uh, in academic circles and practitioner circles and uh, certainly in the press. Um, it goes back to uh, March of 2021. I was at my final Senate Armed Services Committee hearing in an unclassed forum and Senator Sullivan asked me, at first he, he kind of listed the alarming activities that he noted going on around the region, you know, Hong Kong and Tibet and the, uh, the, Uyghur, uh, uh, the Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang, their clash along the line of actual control. And he goes, you know, when I talk to intelligence people, they describe these activities with alarm, with alarm. He goes, you know, do you agree with that assessment? And I said, literally just one word, yes. And then he came back and he said, well, given all these alarming activities, you know, how do you think about, and I quote, any potential conflict in the Taiwan Strait? Um, and I, and he was referring to the timeline in his uh, context. And my response was, I, I again, relisted the alarming activities that he had cited and why. And uh, I said, uh, I, I think when we talk about any potential conflict, our our concerns are manifest this decade, and I'm particularly concerned about the next, uh, within the next six years. Um, go back to March of 2021, suddenly people began to think it was about six years from now. That really wasn't my point. Um, it is about this decade, and um, I, I am concerned about the run-up between now and 2028. And so why, why do you, you know, of all the times to Pick. Why do you pick 2028, 2026? Why, what, what, what is it about these dates that sort of brings those up as, as topics of conversation? Well, you know, listen, I can't possibly elucidate every, you know, piece of the rationale. But, you know, my rationale was based on the intelligence that I was reading. And I was pretty reassured when Secretary Blinken and the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, you know, reaffirmed that timeline that this is the decade of the concern later that year. Um, and I think that's really what people should be focused on. Um, it's less about Davidson window and personalities than it is about the concern that we should have about Chinese, uh, about the communist parties of China's pernicious approach to the region. Maybe you could talk about what you're seeing just the past, say, year of Chinese activity. Has this reinforced your views from 2021? You mean over the last three years? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm both sides of the ledger, I guess that's the way that we have to look at it. Um, you know, first, uh, the PRC and the PLA's pernicious activities continue, right? Um, you know, I used to speak about a pattern of corruption, a pattern of coercement, and a pattern of, a pattern of co-option. And, uh, you know, corruption was through business and government deals, um, you know, some of which was rooted in the Belt and Road Initiative, but others were just, you know, based on uh, uh, Chinese business relationships in the Asia Pacific region. The coercement is, you know, things that we saw that, you know, Jim, you know all too well, um, the economic punishments that China administered to Australia um, for the very you know, debate about a foreign investment law in Australia, you know, allowing 
Australian goods to stack up in um, Chinese ports and not and not be delivered. Uh, and they did the same with Norway, with Canada. I mean, it goes it goes on and on. Uh, and then the collapsion things, which you know, if you really closely examine international institutions, UN led mostly. Um, the PRC has flooded that area with diplomats, and they've ascended to leadership roles in a number of international organizations, telecommunications, aviation, it's, it's all, you know, very important. Um, secondly is, uh, you know, the continued activities in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, which, again, are just more and more alarming. Um, you, you know, you have to really think about the, the visit of, of House Speaker um, Pelosi um, and the activities since then to realize that there's not much more room for PRC to express their displeasure in whatever um, using the PLA um, without actually, you know, tripping the line towards Connect. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, they are doing full blown rehearsals, uh, multi domains, meaning, you know, space, air, sea, land forces. And from multi-directions, meaning from the west of Taiwan and from the east of Taiwan and the Philippine Sea, on attack scenarios. Um, you know, that's incredibly alarming. You know, third, I would add, there's the lessons that they're deriving from Ukraine. And, you know, the first blush, everybody says, oh, you know, they're seeing that these things aren't just such walkovers. Yeah, I, I mean, that's absolutely true. But what do you take away from that? You have to learn how to do that. And when I talk to my former counterparts in the region, you know, some still in government, most, uh, many outside of government, um, they describe as, well, the lessons they're learning is that a much more comprehensive attack delivered with much more violence um, is actually the solution to what they're viewing as Russia's problems in Ukraine. So, you know, that's on the bad side of the ledger. On the good side of the ledger, hey, you really have to recognize that the most important thing that has happened in the Asia Pacific in the 21st century, the most positive security development there is, is Japan's new national security policy. Um, that alone, you know, then the third largest economy, you know, currently the fourth largest economy, you know, argu arguably, um, you know, is the most critical development really since 2021. Pile on to that, then the very uh, deepened alliance relationships between the United States and Japan and between the United States and Australia, especially U.S., Australia, and the U.K. as well uh, with AUKUS, is really profound. And then you've, you've got the rejuvenation of the U.S.-Philippine alliance as well. You know, those are three, four very critical alliance developments. You have to hand it to the current administration. Um, they saw what was necessary to bring um, uh, relationships in a diplomatic sense, in a technological sense, and a military sense closer together in a way that sends a much stronger deterrent signal to China. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's really, really important to think about and will be one of the factors as we examine the rest of the decade and what it looks like. So, Admiral, you've, I mean, you've really kind of hit on the big question, I, I think, it, which is, is China, I, certainly they're preparing for war. Do, are they still hoping that they can get Taiwan back without war? Are they hoping that all of this that this military activity can end up in some sort of coercive scenario where Taiwan comes back voluntarily. Yeah, absolutely. I, I say it all the time. The strategy and execution is not, you know, a, a plan to go to conflict. They would prefer not to go to conflict and to get this outcome through a simple continued erosion of not only Taiwan's deterrence, um, posture, capability, in all forms, you know, economic, diplomatic, technological, militarily, certainly, but an erosion of the deterrent, the conventional deterrent of the United States as well. And again, that would be diplomatic, economic, and militarily. If they see that occur, 
they can start to peel off, you know, countries that are hedging first, you know, countries that are kind of outright friendly to China, you know, we'll take that as a given, then the hedging uh, countries, and then, you know, start to peel apart the alliance network that the U.S., Japan, Australia, the Philippines, others in the region enjoy in a way in which you get the political and diplomatic will to simply collapse. Um, on the military side, it's one of the things we have to be uh, particularly watchful for. Um, we have to ensure that um, Taiwan, and and don't get me wrong, Taiwan's responsibility for Taiwan is priority number one. Um, but we have to help Taiwan ensure its conventional deterrence with the kind of capabilities required um, to prevent the simple collapse or erosion of their conventional deterrent capability, right? They have to have aircraft to respond to persistent ADIS violations. They have to have ships to give them the understanding of what's happening in, in, uh, in the Strait and in and around the Philippine Sea um, and across the East China Sea broadly. Um, so, you know, they need to retain uh, missile defense capability. Uh, you know, all these uh, things that people believe are, you know, the opposite of asymmetric, you know, also needs to be provided for so that the system just doesn't collapse from day-to-day -day use and pressure in the current environment. So, so Admiral, if, if we all agree that China's last desire is to have a shooting war, they'd much rather proceed by unification by doing other, uh, using other tools in our toolkit, such as blockades or quarantines, which they seem to be practicing. How does the U.S. and the world respond to a non-shooting pressure campaign? How do we bring everyone together to work with Taiwan then? Yeah, the, the interesting point, you know, these hard policy decisions, you know, that are retained under sovereign authorities of, of all countries, you know, need the context of what's actually happening at the time. But I, I will say that I participated in an international war game last fall um, that was designed to test those political pressure points. It was a scenario in which uh, blockade slash quarantine some technological inducements, enticements uh, broadly across the global uh, sphere and um, some deliberate coercive actions in the Pacific Island chain, whether that would uh, peel apart the U.S. alliance relationships it has in the region and partner relationships, or whether it would be reinforced. And I was actually encouraged. I mean, this, you know, this was a political, military, academic game. Uh, you know, think track 1.5, people that were well experienced in government from, from uh, three nations. Well, I don't think the report is out yet, so I'll, I'll keep it to myself. But, uh, um, it, and as the pressure went up politically, short of kinetics delivered of China, and we never got to that point. Um, the alliance relationships were reinforced and the contributions that came in diplomatically, economically, militarily, all held true. Um, so you can really tell that the region gets what's happening. And I'm, I'm pretty assured that uh, um, diplomats uh, and defense national security folks in the United States from both sides of the aisle understand the importance as well. Admiral Davidson, I recently got back from uh, Shangri-La, a forum I know that you know very, very well, and it, it the, the kind of the talk of the of the town, as as it were, uh, was the bellicosity of the Chinese delegation and just sort of its stark contrast to the tone of the rest of the of the discussion there, and you know the, just the the idea that it seems to be that the dialogue with China is just deteriorating to the point where the we're, you know. We're talking past each other. They're, they've they've come to deliver messages. It's not even clear that they're delivering messages to us as they are to their 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 bosses back in Beijing. Um, is that is that something that you observed in your time? You know, progressively this sort of uh, this this trend, and how much does it alarm you? Um, I, I I wouldn't say progressively. I, I felt like they've been pretty bellicose. Certainly, you know, when I returned to the Pacific in 2018. Um, that was absolutely 
the behaviors that I observed, Shangri-La is one thing. Um, you know, we continued to invite um, PRC military officials to the Asia Pacific CHOD conference, Chiefs of Defense conference. Um, and while they never sent the Chief of Defense, um, they sent a very senior officer. And um, for me, and I think for the U.S. agenda, they actually helped us. That level of bellicosity um, really caused the the, <laughs> the other chads uh, across the region to recoil. And um, it was good to see many of those chads, e even ones with significantly less capability, push back publicly on that tone. Um, and the, you know, again, um, the the implied threats that went along with it, whether it was, you know, in the economic realm or in the military realm, um, the implied threats that, that went against us. It, more than anything, it helped our U.S. strategy. And it's one of the reasons, you know, I maintain, you know, all elements of U.S. power, you know, applied, um, you know, somewhat equally, just to use the term, but necessarily, is so important for U.S. engagement in the region. We can't just be there militarily. We can't just be there diplomatically. We can't just be there economically. We have to knit together all three of those things and the other elements, right, information and technological and all that, financial, um, to actually, you know, be a presence, right? Um, it, is the, it is the idea of America <laughs> and the broad approach that we've, you know, had for nearly a century in the region about our principle-based approach that is so attractive, right? If we only make our approach transactional, we'll do this in the economic sphere if you do this in the military sphere, or we'll only do this if you do this for us. They get that from the, from the PRC all the time. No one in the region wants to deal with us transactionally. They want to deal with the America that they've known over the last 80 years. And, and I think that's critically important that we use all those tools in order to construct, you know, the wholeness of a conventional deterrent. That's, uh, as a former diplomat, I say amen. Um, as a former economic officer, I say amen double shot. Uh, unfortunately, we are absent as far as the trade policy in the region. Yeah. Our aid programs there are, frankly, minuscule. There's a new program for infrastructure development. We'll see if this one gets off the ground for a change. Um, but, you know, we were, we were talking to Bridge Colby the other day uh, about the same subject. And he agreed that we need to apply all our national power, but only to the Asia Pacific, that basically we don't have the resources anymore to deal with events in Europe or the Middle East or Africa. Um, would that approach help as commander of indo pacom Would that have helped you? A, B, what would other countries in the region make of that sort of strategy, in your opinion? Well, you know, it's, it's something I actually speak quite a bit about um, when I'm engaging across America. Um, you know, what's going on in Ukraine is every bit as important to the United States and the global security structure than anything in Taiwan would be. Um, you know, you have to really think about, there's 190 odd countries on the planet, right? How many are truly in an alliance structure with the United States? Um, you know, mutual defense, right? There's NATO, you know, we're around 30. Uh, we have the five relationships we have uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, with Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Australia, and Th Thailand, which is, you know, um, somewhat of a modification when you think about the other four. Um, we have the relationship with Israel. Um, there's another, you know, 150 nations out there on the planet that are riding outside of the alliance structure. And they're watching this closely, right? Because this is about U.S. commitment. U.S. commitment to... Um, you know, the promises that we've made and the principles by which the rest of the world has looked to America and looked to America for, for almost 250 years now. Um, that's really, really powerful. 
Uh, think about, you know, a country like Ukraine, a country like Taiwan that's outside that formal alliance network. What do, what do they take away from all this? You know, what do they think about the attacks um, that are occurring and, and the inducements? You know, countries like them. And uh, they're watching to see if we're the America that they remember, um, that will live up to our commitments. And for Americans, you know, you have to think about the rest of the globe there, right? I, I, I mean, just alone, the Asia Pacific, right? Two thirds of the world's population, two thirds of the global economy will be resonant in the Asia Pacific in by 2030. If we're not part, a reliable partner, and a country like Ukraine or Taiwan falls, do you think these other nations are going to say, well, you know, that's an economic partner I want to be with, a diplomatic partner I want to be with, a security partner I want to be with? Do you think they'll be able to trade their innovations or ideas with us? Or will someone else be dictating those outcomes to them? And there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, the you know, the bad actors on the planet right now, Russia, China, Iran, you know, they will dictate terms to these other countries in a way in which the United States and our interests will be excluded. Um, it's, that's a severe detriment to our prosperity and to our security as we think about the U.S. Uh, place in the world. Um, so we absolutely, you know, we have the time, we have the the industrial base to address these concerns in the Ukraine and in Taiwan as well. So, Admiral, I mean, you're really uh, kind of hitting on some of the the same themes from a different angle as as Bridge Colby did. And you brought up the industrial base. Uh, I think he would say that do we have the industrial base? And I mean, because all, really in the in in this case. It, kind of boils down to a discussion about resources. And I know that I uh, recall very clearly that when you came to Indo-PACOM, you were making a very strenuous argument at, uh, at Congress and other places about the resources that we needed in, 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 in the Indo-Pacific Command in order to uh, maintain our deterrent, in order to uh, be credible. Um, do we have sufficient resources devoted to the Indo-Pacific theater? Um, well, I mean, certainly, I, I, I mean, we could spend an hour on this alone. I, I mean, I do believe that more resources needed to be and continue to need to be um, ported to the Indo-Pacific theater. And, you know, that's not just military resources. Um, you know, it's across the whole of the government. And Jim alluded to some of that. Um, that's absolutely necessary. Do I think that there's the trade space in the department to, to do what we need to do? Yeah, I do. You know, people forget about the profound changes that we made just 20 years ago to shift, you, you, you know, to the counterinsurgency constabulary um, investments that were necessary when we were so deeply involved in Southwest Asia in the post 911 era. You know, the, the total budget pie um, went up, right? The way those slices happened per department, you know, shifted to the ground forces. Um, Naval and air forces, you know, converted people to actually, you know, do blue and support a green, not just joint, you know, missions. You know, I remind people all the time that we had more sailors on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan at the peak of those wars than we have submariners in the submarine force. Um, we can't forget that. And we did that during that time frame. We changed the entire investment profile, right? MRAPs, JDAMs, um, you know, stationary targets, drones, uh, you know, the kit for all our soldiers, Marines, um, airmen, sailors that were on the ground in, in uh, Iraq um, and Afghanistan. All that needs to be considered through. All that needs to be sorted on and some hard decisions made. Um, but I, I, I think it's absolutely necessary. Getting, getting back to uh, Chinese activity again for a second, Ray and I were discussing earlier, and we haven't seen before the Chinese 
amp up their activity around the Senkakus, Taiwan, and the South China Sea simultaneously, and getting more bellicose about all three simultaneously. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, it's a growing capacity, right? Number of ships, aircraft, uh, troops. They're fleshing out the sophistication of their concepts of employment, right? That is, you know, when do they go on patrol? How do they go on patrol? You know, how do they interact with each other? Um, the joint uh, PLA force, um, how is the command and control ex exercise doing that? And they've been certainly observing U.S. operations in the region. You know, I'm sure other of our allies in the region as well. And they are adapting many of those principles as they announced back in the 2017, 2018 timeframe that they would be doing um, to do that. And, um, uh, you know, to, to, when I say to do that, to be able to increase their posture in the region. Remember, uh, the strategy and execution is to erode the conventional deterrent posture that's out there. Um, they do that by partially um, convincing others that their presence is more meaningful than the United States presence or our operations with our allies and partners in the region and that allied network in hopes that the deterrent structure will erode and then eventually collapse. Um, we have to be able to respond to that increased capacity that they're showing. We have to be more inventive with our own concepts of employment and, you know, make clear that um, the United States as an Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific nation is going to persist. So this brings up the question of force structure and particularly we talk about maritime forces. China's maritime forces are unlike any that that we've seen, at least in modern times, they've got this immense Coast Guard with these massive ships that seem to kind of dominate the space that they're that we're in. Of course, they've got this unusual creature called the maritime militia. Um, and they basically turned themselves into the local constabulary for for whatever space it is that they want to, you know, claim as their jurisdiction. So, you know, we may steam through with a carrier battle group once in a while, or we may do a, 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 a you know a, a presence operation or a freedom of navigation operation, and, and and we're here and then we're gone. But they're still there with you know dozens of militia and coast guard ships, uh, and that's that's who the the local nations are, are used to seeing now. Uh, do we need to take a hard look at what our maritime force structure looks like in order to, and, or how do we respond to this asymmetric threat? Yeah, well, you know. You're certainly seeing that the high-end capability that the Navy has is going to be required. I mean, since the operations in the Red Sea are over the last nine months are indicative of that. Um, but, you know, there there is a call and there's been a standing, um, uh, what would you call it, requirement um, that the Navy has put forth going all the way back to 2015, 2016 timeframe that the U.S. Navy needs to be larger. Um, uh, the employment of its low-end capabilities, and I would add Coast Guard to this, and by that I mean frigates and littoral combat ships and ships that you could do more engagements with, um, is necessary in the region. Um, but, you know, don't kid yourself about, you know, what, actual fighting power is, right? You know, if we were thinking about it in air terms or land terms, you, you wouldn't necessarily put people in a high-end conflict with less capability that would get destroyed. Um, you've got to be able to have, you know, scale at the right level as well. So I am not in the least an advocate that we need a smaller high-end Navy. Um, um, you know, we know where the talents lie when it comes to the United States Navy and its comparison with other navies on the planet. Making sure that some of those other navies on the planet had some of those low end capabilities where their talents better lie, their interactions in the region need to be more persistent, where their um, actions need to be um, uh, uh, more assertive. Um, that's absolutely necessary. And it's, the alliance 
relationships that the United States enjoys, the step up of countries like Australia, like Japan, like the UK that could help, you know, provide and assist, you know, some of those capabilities with nations like the Philippines and others in the region um, uh, so that they can push back on some of this maritime militia activity. All right. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. But for my last question, I guess I can go back to your your call for the U.S. to demonstrate it's all in in Asia Pacific as far as bringing national power to bear, being a reliable partner, not only militarily, but for our values and our way of life and our approach, differentiating it from the PRC. But what we're seeing, in fact, is a lot of Alliance, well, not alliances, arrangements being made outside of us, this so called lattice work, like between Australia, Japan, uh, and India, for instance. I think it's a reflection of uncertainty about where the US is going to go. And then we're trying to navigate what happens in the worst case scenario if the US turns more inward. Um, is this a net benefit to us? That it, it's deepening these relationships, or is it that? They're going to find ways to reach a modus vivendi with an absent U.S. and a rising China. Yeah. You know, I always said, uh, I had a wise mentor once tell me that, the, you know, the good thing about someone is also the bad thing about someone. And <laughs> never forget that. And, and that's, you know, part of the one of the ways to think about the Lattice Network, which I, you know, when, when you're putting together the ledger right now, you know, the pros outweigh the cons, certainly. Um. And, you know, I think we're, the United States has an expectation that other nations will um, be security contributors uh, in the region. I, you know, I think that is a political sense that has developed really on both sides of the aisle across Washington. But we're seeing nations do it now. And, and we have to respect, you know, those decisions, not the transactional way, but in a way to think about, you know, how is this power actually leveraged? And what does it look like? The cons come in where, you know, if confidence in the United States erodes significantly for whatever electoral path, trade path, whatever the needs might be, then, you know, that whole lattice could be peeled off. So one of the things that really struck me in all my engagements with Japan uh, during my time at Indo-Pacific Command and their growing concern over the PLA and the PRC's activities in and around the Senkakus, in and around the East China Sea, in and around the South China Sea, in and around Taiwan. And, you know, their growing mill-to-mill -mill relationship with Russia was what it meant for Japan and what this trajectory might look like um, for them, you know, as a sovereign nation, um, if Taiwan were to fall, um, you think about the accesses that Japan enjoys and, and the limitations that would be put on that. Um, you think about how the PRC thinks about Japan, Japan's alliance with the United States, uh, Japan's broad influence across the region and what those punishments might be for others uh, that deal with Japan um, could be, you know, a real, real security crisis. But there's no doubt in my mind for a country like Japan that has been dealing with China for 14 centuries and thinks about its security concerns, um, how they might think about an unreliable United States and whether they would have to make choices independent of the United States to assure their security. Um, it's why our involvement with NATO in Ukraine, with Japan, AUKUS, Australia, or other allies in the region, why it's so important and why we need to continue to deepen that relationship, not only in a diplomatic sense, but now take it to the next steps. And, you know, we probably won't get into it here, but, you know, command and control relationships between the U.S. and Japan, what they look like, you know, how our forces might be better integrated, um, not only in conflict, but in potentially day-to-day -day deterrent operations. 
these are all important considerations that, that are required to deepen um, that alliance um, uh, relationship, you know, formed at the diplomatic level. Um, and then as Americans, we need to think about, you know, how all these alliances truly benefit the United States in terms of our security and our prosperity. Um, it is certainly a two-way street, and um, we should be thinking about investing more deeply in them and certainly not departing from them. Well, on that <clears throat> note, which is an excellent note to end on in an election year, hopefully our, uh, our fellow Americans will think deeply on those things. Uh, sir, it has been very good to see you again. It has been a pleasure and an honor to have you on our, our little podcast here, and uh, hopefully we can have you back. It's always good to see you, Ray, Jim. Appreciate it, and um, look forward to seeing you maybe next year. Well, Jim, it, was, it really was great to see Admiral Davidson again. Um, he, uh, he seems much more relaxed than the last time I, I remember seeing him. Of course, the last time I remember seeing, seeing him, he was still in uniform. Yeah, well, when you're in charge of 380,000 people, I guess it adds a little tension to your day. Yeah, indeed. But, you know, I, the, 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 the thing that I thought about, you know, we've had all of these. Um, we actually have had several Taiwan discussions recently. We had, of course, uh, Mick Ryan and Mike Studeman, outstanding uh a session and which got a lot of attention um, on both on audio and video, um, and then of course uh, Elbridge Colby, who has a very specific take uh, about Taiwan and the need to prioritize. And so this was really the third of ours, uh, who which is sort of focused on Taiwan, even though others have, have have covered it. And you know that may feel a little overdone, maybe because we're you know, we're still early and we've got a large proportion of of our of our episodes on Taiwan. But of course, the, the the danger is as a nation. I mean, we're going into an election year in which that Davidson window, so called, uh, is opening, and it seems like we're about to have a couple of debates. And I'm not sure Taiwan will make it into either one, even though it has the potential to be the most important thing happening in the near future. Well, that's absolutely right. And clearly all of our guests have indicated what a serious situation it is. And we read about that every day. And every day now we're reading about China sort of upping the ante, you know, crossing the uh, midpoint line, practicing quarantine and blockade efforts, and just making bellicose statements. So clearly it's a problem. Now, one thing I will note for us and our audience is that all our guests were military who discussed this, except except Bridge, who is uh, not Defend, military, but defense adjacent at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe we need to speak to some non-defense people to get their take. But I'm struck by the pretty uniform agreement they all have on the need to defend Taiwan. Yeah, and and, and I mean I think that's that's a that's a fair observation. And again, as a you know retired military guy myself, I we're, we're we were paid for a long, long time to worry about things like this. And so that's what we do. Right. Um, but I mean, uh, it really does. Um, it, it, when I walk into the voting booth, it will certainly be on my mind. Right. What is what is what is the potential that we end up in some kind of a major theater war or worse uh, in the in the coming four to eight years? And I, I mean, that's that is a a, a bracing uh, possibility, and yet most of our fellow Americans probably won't think about that at all. Well, big hairy problems like that when they're concerned about other things, just domestically, sure. not unusual. Yeah. Um, but boy, it would be front and center if if uh, the balloon goes up. Well, and the, and the reason I say that, and it's not not to sort of pick on people who don't do national security for a living, because that's not fair at all. <clears throat> but it's just the fact that. You know, as each one of these guests has talked about, you know, the best way to to prevent a war is to deter a war. And the only way to deter a war really in the end is to you know make the other side think that it's just not worth, you know, going to war. And, and that takes a lot of preparation and and frankly, resources. So when you're in the voting booth. You have to decide which candidate will have policies that accomplish that better. I mean, that's certainly going to be a, a very important topic at the front of my mind. 
So I, well, anyway, I, you know, I, I don't want to belabor that too much, but it is something I think that, you know, not just in America, but, you know, across the region really should be occupying a lot of thought because it, it I mean, every day I look at my news, of course, my news is selectively, I, I look at the news that I look at and I see lots of provocations, lots of discussion, lots of, of, of pretty aggressive statements coming out of Beijing about this one issue. I will say that one thing Washington seems to be united about across both parties is the need to stand up to China. Yeah, and, like and I, 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 I do think that, you know, that's that's been a helpful uh, development. Um, I just hope that we see the resources follow, honestly. Uh, we will see. <laughs> All right. Well, Jim, that's depressing. So 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 it's it's time to cheer me up. Uh, so do you have a do you have a, do you have a nice story to tell me today or? You have another depressing well, story. I'll, I'll let you decide the nature of it. Uh, so I was in my second tour in South Africa. And, you know, I'm an eager, young foreign service officer. And I like talking to people and seeing what they do. And I got called in by the, uh, the station chief, the head of the CIA there. And they said, Jim, uh, the word around town is that you are working for us. I said, well, why, why is that? Well, because you're too nice. If you weren't so damn nice, they'd just assume you're a State Department guy because they're all dicks. <laughs> and he was serious. Uh, so, 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 so did you become meaner? Uh, no, I told him that they're all dicks too. <laughs> all right. Well, um, Ian, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what to do uh, with that from a production standpoint. Uh, perhaps, perhaps they're all named Richard. Is what he was right. saying. They're, they're Richards, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I will say that I have met plenty of people from that particular agency who were very nice people. Absolutely, I was. I was just being what I was accused of being. <laughs> All right. Well, Jim. On that note, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up for this episode. Uh, and again, we want to thank all, all of our listeners. Uh, please do subscribe. Uh, it really does help us out. And, and share it with your friends uh, because it helps us, helps us get that word out. For Ian and Jim, I'm Ray, and we will talk to you next time.